So as I was just saying then, we're going to have a presentation by way of introduction to the House of Bishops report on marriage and same-sex relationships after the shared conversations and to this afternoon's group work. So I invite the chair, the Bishop of Norwich, Graham James, and the vice chair, the Bishop of Wilston, Pete Broadbent, of the Reflex Bishop's Reflection Group on Sexuality to make their presentation. Thank you. Members of Synod, in this uh, presentation, the Bishop of Wilsdon will follow what I have to say by focusing on the group process this afternoon and what it's hoped may be gained from it. And uh, I will formally introduce the report GS2055 later. What I want to do now is to attempt a wider and longer perspective and why I hope the case studies may prove useful. Um, for almost the whole of the 41 years now of my ordained ministry, we seem to have been discussing same-sex relationships. As a curate in the late 1970s, I recall leading a deanery synod discussion on the Gloucester Report on Homosexual Relationships. No one else was willing to do it. Little did I think that almost 40 years later, I'd be standing before the General Synod presenting another report on the same subject. It is a very provisional report, as it says of itself. Like others which have gone before it, it has not received a rapturous reception in all quarters, and I regret uh, any pain and anger it may have caused, and if we've got the tone wrong, we are very sorry. Next week, I will have been a bishop for 24 years, and throughout that time, I've cherished the friendships of many gay people and sought to support the gay clergy in my diocese and tried to make it a safe and welcoming place for their ministry. Only they can say whether they feel that's true. But I know the Church of England owes them much. Some minister in our most challenging parishes and situations. And I'm also a bishop who seeks to be loyal to the Catholic tradition of our church and the doctrine of the universal church as we have received it. And I do not seek to elevate my opinion and experience above that of scripture and the received tradition of the church. I've learned much too from evangelical clergy and laity who frequently challenged me in my understanding of scripture. And the promises made at my Episcopal consecration all those years ago remain with me on a daily basis. I do accept the Holy Scriptures as revealing all things necessary for eternal salvation. I do believe the doctrine of the Christian faith as the Church of England has received it and seek to expound and teach it. I do seek to uphold the truth of the gospel against error and to promote unity, peace and love among the people I serve. These things weigh heavily with me and my fellow bishops. And yet they are, of course, a liberation, not a burden. For as bishops, we know how much we have been given, how much we have received, and how much we still have to learn through the grace of Christ. Now, I'd be misleading you if I did not confess to being conflicted in presenting this report. But in that, I think I'm far from alone among the bishops and in the wider Church of England. At one level, nothing much seems to have changed since I made that presentation on the Gloucester Report so many years ago. And yet at another level, everything seems to have changed, especially in the wider culture. And our own history in dealing with these matters also explains why people on all sides of the debate rarely find themselves satisfied. And I want to spend some time examining that history. Perhaps it is because we are so conflicted that the House of Bishops found case studies so valuable. They based our conversations in the lived experience of the church, for the case studies we used were grounded in real life events. Of course, there's pastoral distance since the events are anonymized and the people are not in the room with us. A pastoral response is invited 
and our response reveals how our theological formation shapes it. Indeed, we may discover that our pastoral response begins to reshape our theological convictions. There's always a dialogue between doctrine and pastoral practice, and sometimes it lies within us. And among the things the case studies revealed to the bishops was the breadth of pastoral responses which lay within the present disciplines of the church. Sometimes it's our own pastoral imagination which is lacking rather than pastoral possibilities. And that's what led to the use of the phrase maximum freedom in relation to the interpretation of existing law and guidance. We began to believe there were more possibilities for development within our present disciplines than may have been perceived. And I'll say more about that when introducing the debate later today. In this session, I want to reflect on why the narrative of our discussions on human sexuality has been so testing over the years and why it remains so. And one of the reasons is that we do not start, and perhaps cannot start, our discussions from scratch, nor even from the scriptures, but largely from two key statements, both of which have remained in place from the period 1987 to 1991. And those statements did not begin to anticipate the wider situation in society we now experience with the advent of same-sex marriage. But the story goes back well before 1987. The Wolfenden Report, shared by an eminent Anglican layman, was published in 1957. Its key recommendation, of course, was that homosexual acts between consenting adults should cease to be a criminal offence. A whole decade passed before the Sexual Offences Act reached the statute book, 50 years ago this year. The campaign for change received strong support from the Archbishop of Canterbury and most of the bishops at the time. And Michael Ramsey was clear that there was a distinction between a crime and a sin. Some of the opponents of decriminalization said the bishops were being naive if they thought a change in the law would not lead to the promotion of homosexuality and its eventual acceptance as an alternative lifestyle. As it was, Norman Pittinger's Time for Consent was published in 1970, arguing within the Christian community for the moral worth of same-sex relationships. And a growing acceptance of homosexual lifestyles was well reflected in the Gloucester Report, simply titled Homosexual Relationships, published by the Board of Social Responsibility in 1979 and the subject of my deanery synod discussion all those years ago. The subtitle was a contribution to discussion, and it's worth noting. There was a general reluctance to opine and define in this area within the Church of England at the time. The Lambeth Conferences of 1978 and 1988 were the first to have resolutions directly referring to homosexuality. And those resolutions are now almost entirely forgotten. The 1988 Lambeth Conference spoke about the need for, I quote, a deep and dispassionate discussion, study, of the question of homosexuality which would take seriously both the teaching of scripture and the results of scientific and medical research. I'm not sure we've yet been attentive enough to scientific and medical research. The possibility, even by then, of a dispassionate study of same-sex relationships was a vain hope. And within the Church of England, things became more complicated in the 1980s the bishops continued to be content with contributions to discussion, but there was a discernible shift of opinion in the public mind. Despite her reputation for moral certainties, Margaret Thatcher was not at all morally censorious in sexual matters, but there was a spirit of reaction around. 
fed not least by the popular media of the time, which was hostile to homosexual relationships. This eventually led to the passage of Clause 28 of the Local Government Act 1988, which prohibited the promotion of homosexuality in schools and stopped local councils spending money supporting lesbian and gay projects. It also prevented the support of what it called pretended family relationships, namely same-sex partners having a normal family life. And while all this was building up, the House of Bishops looked to the then Board for Social Responsibility for further advice on matters to do with homosexuality. A working party was formed in 1986 under the leadership of the present Dean of Salisbury, June Osborne. It reported in 1989, but the report was never published at the time because things had moved on in ways in which I suspect a number of the bishops then wished they hadn't. Tony Higton's private member's motion in the General Synod in November 1987 caught something of the spirit of the age. For the first time, as far as I can discover, an authoritative body in the Church of England officially pronounced on the moral worth of homosexual relationships. It was argued that it simply restated traditional teaching, though it did so, of course, in the terse terms of a general synod motion. And that motion stated that sexual intercourse properly belongs within marriage, and that fornication and adultery are sins against this ideal, as are homosexual genital acts, which are to be met by a call to repentance and the exercise of compassion. And finally, it declared that all Christians are called to be exemplary in all matters of morality, including sexual morality, and that holiness of life is particularly required of Christian leaders. Nearly everything that has happened in the Church of England on these issues since then has been in reaction to that motion. The vote in Synod at the time was overwhelming, 403 to 8. What we are liable to forget is the reaction in some of the popular media to the passing of that vote. It was to criticize the church for being too liberal. Since I was sitting behind the Archbishop of Canterbury in 1987, I remember the vote and its aftermath very well. Some of you may possibly recall the tabloid headlines which use language which would be unthinkable today in any sector of the press. The House of Bishops had to respond, and they did so eventually with the publication of Issues in Human Sexuality, a statement by the House of Bishops in 1991. And in his foreword, the Archbishop of Canterbury, by then George Carey, famously said it was, it was not the last word on the subject, indeed not, <laughs> issues was intended to help, in its own words, a general process marked by greater trust and openness of Christian reflection on the subject of human sexuality. We are now further in time, my friends, from the publication of issues in human sexuality than the publication of issues was from the decriminalization of homosexuality in this land. Issues was not to be the last word, but it became policy. And this is one of the most surprising developments, given what Issues says of itself. Fairly quickly in the 1990s, candidates for Episcopal office had to pledge their loyalty to it. In time, all ordinance had to pledge willingness to live within the discipline set out in Issues, and they still do. Issues famously picked up on the Higton motion's phrase about exemplary Christian leaders. The ordinal is clear about the way in which the clergy are called to embody the way of Christ in their lives and to acknowledge the teaching of the Christian faith as the Church of England has received it. Notwithstanding all this, Issues has been frequently criticized, if sometimes unfairly, 
for creating different moral standards for clergy and lay people. And what was significant about issues was that it was clear that lay people who did conscientiously dissent and lived in same-sex relationships should be incorporated fully within the life of the church. Sometimes it's assumed that when ordinands are asked if they will live within the disciplines of issues, it is simply about whether they will remain celibate if in a same-sex relationship. The, teach, the disciplines of issues, of course, also include the welcome given to lay people who do enter same-sex partnerships to be part of the body of Christ on the same basis as everyone else. And the teaching and guidance in issues form the framework for the House of Bishops pastoral statement on civil partnerships issued in 2005, a further statement on Episcopal ministry in 2013 which said that any gay or lesbian person living within the disciplines outlined in issues and in a partnership could become a bishop. And then in February 2014, there was a further statement from the House in relation to same-sex marriage. These different statements were attempts to respond to a vastly changed landscape, but within the disciplines articulated in 1991. Issues did not begin to glimpse civil partnerships let alone same-sex marriage, which is why the House of Bishops believes a new teaching document is necessary, addressing both marriage and same-sex relationships in a way which has not been attempted. And what the case studies seek to do is to present us with the tension which can exist between our determination to uphold firmly the teaching on marriage and sexual relationships as currently expressed in our canons, and the commitment to affirm the place of LGBTI people within the church, and as paragraph 34 of the report says, to enable their voices to be heard. While it's beyond my pay grade to chart the way forward, I've always taken the view that the reflection group I chaired was responsible simply for the process in the college and the house at this initial stage. Any group drafting the teaching document, would need to draw its membership from well beyond the house, including lesbian and gay people, theologians, parish clergy, and others. And equally, a group on the development of pastoral practice would also need broad representation. The case studies in the house and the College of Bishops prompted conversations of very different character and quality on this subject than we have had in my very long memory of such meetings. And the House believed it would be helpful for members of the General Synod to engage in a similar process. And with the, with the Synod's permission, I will now pass directly to the Bishop of Wilsdon to describe in more detail what we will do in this afternoon session. Thank you, members of Synod. Pete Broadbent, Southern Suffragans, number 46. Now, I confess, I don't normally enjoy group work. Uh, in many a clergy study day or conference, uh, the one thing guaranteed to send half our priests scuttling for cover has been that moment when the facilitator stands up and says, uh, we're now going to divide you into groups. So I'm not sure I'm the best advocate uh, for persuading you to enjoy the groups this afternoon, but I want to try and do so. Uh, it falls to me to try to help Synod with the questions of process that we're now engaged in uh, over these uh, next hours uh, as we move to the group work and then the take note motion. I think I need to go back a stage. I, I don't want to attempt an exercise uh, in self-justification. I don't really want to spend time in explanation I don't want to make excuses for the House of Bishops document. I do want to apologize to those members of Synod who found our report difficult, uh, who didn't recognize themselves in it, uh, who'd expected more from us uh, than we actually delivered uh, for the tone of the report. So on behalf of the House, uh, and without being trite uh, or trivial, I'm sorry. It might be helpful as we seek to learn from the experience of all this 
to analyze one or two points uh, that have been the subject of debate in the blogosphere and on social and mainstream media. What actually happened? Well, you can't know what happened in the House because we were under the protocols. But the House and the College spent its own time over the autumn period in doing its own group work and shared conversations. The role of the Reflections Group, which has been slightly exaggerated by some commentators, uh, was merely to steer the process and help us come to a common mind. We haven't suppressed the diversity of understanding and the range of views that exist in the House and the College. What we've tried to do, and what we try to do in the document, is to express a common mind, an expression of where the House's thinking has got to. It's a pretty conservative document, but it is owned by the whole House and the vast majority of the College. So it'd be wrong, I think, to say that this is a constipated exercise in maintaining a false unity among us. One of the things that was formative for us all in our deliberations was our experience of group work, uh, using case studies which were not dissimilar uh, from those that have been distributed to this afternoon, for this afternoon. Uh, the case studies helped us focus on the pastoral realities which are a part of the life of bishops and parish clergy and all clergy on a well-nigh weekly basis. They weren't a way of objectifying the flesh and blood lives of lesbian and gay members of our churches, nor were they a way of ignoring what we'd encountered in the shared conversations, uh, both in the diocese and the July Synod. In our deliberations, what we did was this. We, we set ourselves a range of possibilities of ways forward for the church. Uh, from one end of the spectrum, a, a retrenchment to a more conservative pastoral approach, through to our existing situation, onwards into the provision of official liturgies, uh, and onwards into the possibility of what it might look like if we went for full acceptance of uh, gay marriage uh, with all that goes with it in the church. What the case studies did was they helped us to test the way in which our theological understanding our instinctive pastoral responses, our calling as bishops to focus unity in the church, and our calling to be guardians of the faith inform the way in which we come to a proposal. Paragraph one of GS 2055 puts it like this. Addressing them involves fidelity to scripture, the proper understanding of how the church's traditions shape its current discipleship, and the ways that changing approaches to human knowledge and reason inform or challenge the Christian faith as we have received it. I guess what we're inviting members of Synod to do is to share that experience. Now, I recognize there are some of you, uh, and you've written to us already, uh, who don't want to take part because they've lost trust in the process. I, I regret that decision. As I said to others who took a similar decision from a different point of view at the July Synod, uh, I don't think it's sensible uh, to absent yourself from uh, what's a very important formative discussion. Being part of the process is always preferable to non-participation, and we want every voice uh, to be in the room and to be heard. Uh, the anonymized case studies are all based on real-life situations, and they help us explore what that phrase that uh, we used in the report might actually mean. Interpreting the existing law and guidance to permit maximum possible freedom within it. It's become a kind of odd word we've debated around. People are slightly fearful of it. That phrase doesn't uh, resonate, with every, resonate with everybody, but it is the area we'd like to explore and the case studies will help us do that. Uh, the bishops have been tasked with chairing the groups uh, which at least means that those of us who are allergic to small groups had to turn up. <laughs> it would be perfectly possible for a group, if they wanted to, to appoint someone else to chair it, if that was their decision. Uh, please come, though, to the groups prepared, ready to participate, uh, and to contribute to the fullest possible feedback on the questions that are raised. 
I recognize there are all kinds of vulnerabilities, uh, not just from uh, one sort of subsection of people, but from all sorts of people. And I need to remind you again, the protocols remain in place and they should be rigorously adhered to uh, and not ignored. On to the debate on the report itself. I need to reiterate the factual position about what it means to take notes. You'll hear more about this, but let's have it in our thinking as we go to our groups. As I said when we launched the report, such a debate is on a neutral motion. It allows Synod to discuss the content and recommendations contained in the report, but a vote in favor of the motion to take note does not commit the Synod to the acceptance of any matter in the report. That's the standing orders, that's not me. Uh, of course, not taking note has become uh, totemic. There are even badges for it uh, for many members of Synod. If Synod declines to take note, uh, the report in its present form can't come back to us. Though we will still have to find a way uh, for the discussion to move forward. In the debate and in the discussion groups, uh, the House will be listening hard, particularly for answers to the questions we've posed in paragraph 70 of the report, uh, but also to other questions you want to raise. Uh, we're not trying to limit the agenda here. We want members to address what we've put before you in all good faith. Whether you like what we've said, or not. It would be good if you could agree to take note. Uh, we're not claiming our report is the last word. It's a situation report. It represents where our thinking has got to. You may not like it, but that's where we are. Taking note does not commit you to our thinking. A couple of final process questions. Uh, we need to recognize that behind this debate, and perhaps often unacknowledged, uh, lie several major, major fault lines. There really is no shared theological understanding between those who see themselves as upholding from the point of view of scripture an orthodox position for no change, and those who see themselves advocating from the point of view of scripture a position of change. Uh, and we sometimes forget that until we start talking to each other. Very fertile conversation about that in the pub last night. We also lack a consensus on what we mean by good disagreement. Is it about process or is it about outcomes? You see, good disagreement is something we can, we can have but not change or change radically. But it can also be a description of living together in the church as an outcome. And I think, again, we disagree among ourselves as to what we're looking for out of that phrase good disagreement. It's part of the reason it didn't appear very much in our report. I think the many who want change uh, quite sincerely uh, want good disagreement to mean pluriformity of practice in the church. Others don't believe that's possible because of the canonical and legal restraints and constraints of uniformity within our church. We need seriously to address that. That's why the legal advice uh, is appended to our report to show us what the issues are we have to address uh, whatever we do. The last thing I want to say is that I think this debate is going to be a continuing problem for us uh, in terms of disagreement uh, because we haven't coalesced around an end point. When we legislated for women to be bishops, even those who were opposed came to the view the Church of England had to make it possible for women to be bishops in the Church of God according to our canons and formularies. In this debate, uh, we haven't even to begun to define a place uh, where we can coalesce. The bishop's report acknowledges a place of starting. More conversation is needed, I hope not interminable. We don't yet know the next stage, uh, there are no secret plans up the bishop's sleeves uh, about what we do next, nor yet are there plans about when and whether uh, we can bring a further report to Synod. The amount of work that uh, could be involved in, for instance, uh, a teaching document is fairly substantial, and we don't want to rush that. Please make the fullest possible use of the opportunities today in the groups and the debate, and you will enable 
our deliberations. Thank you.